Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we are continuing with the novel Earthman Come Home by James Blish which is the third novel in his Cities in Flight series. This is part two. For part one and for the other novels in the series there will be a link to a playlist at the end of the video. Before we begin you could do me a favor by subscribing and giving us a like and now Part 2 of Earthman Come Home. New York has landed on the planet He. It is the only habitable planet that is in orbit around the Wild Star. The Wild Star is a single star that is currently traversing the rift. Amalfi is speaking to a native technician whose name is Miraman. Miraman tells him that any technician would be able to tell that New York is simply a city that is built on technology superior to their own. He goes on to say that on their planet, religion is the powerful force and it wouldn't be smart to have public sentiment against that. Amalfi tells him that the situation on this planet is unique and then asks him when did their civilization fall. Miraman told him that it happened about 8,000 years ago and there's nothing left but legend that there was a high culture at that time and the climate was different. It got cold regularly every year. And at that time, there were many more stars in the sky, thousands of them. At least that's what the ancient carvings show. Amalfi told him that they are currently moving through the rift and that it will be a few thousand years before they see other stars. Miriman was doubtful about that, but he goes on to tell Amalfi that their priests tell them that they're in hell that's why they are so hot and that they have to redeem their sins so that they can get back among the cool stars again that they have no heaven when they die they die damned what Amalfi didn't tell him is that their planet has a axis that tilts every so often and it was just bad luck that the axle tilt happened just at the same time that the planet began its journey across the rift and that changed the climate of the planet which in turn caused their civilization to collapse and right now the planet is back in a period of warring city-states then Amalfi asked him what would have happened if he had unlocked the cage and Miraman told him that he probably would have been killed or they would have tried to kill him that releasing the women would be considered a great evil since the priests say it was the women that brought the sins of the great age down on them. Now there are cities around called bandit cities where that religion no longer holds sway. So that's why there are so many deserters headed for the bandit cities. He goes on to say that while their cities fight the jungle, the bandit cities don't fight the jungle. They just prey on those who do. It seems that the first thing the bandit cities do when they revolt is to kill off all the priests. That's when Amalfi got around to telling him what he wants. They want permission to mine metals that is abundant on the planet. And they can't just go and mine it without permission because their law enforcement agencies will not allow it. Miraman then told Amalfi he knows what the priests will ask for in return for giving them permission to mine. And that is to destroy the jungle. And he also thinks that they will ask for the cure for death so they can use it on themselves and hide it from the rest of the people. For Amalfi, the problem with destroying the jungle is that even when they destroy it, it would grow back. So he contacted the city fathers to find out how could they wipe out the jungle and keep it from coming back. The city fathers told him that it is possible if they were able to stabilize the planet's axis. When the city fathers realized that Amalfi was considering tipping the planet to stop the jungle from coming back, it was beginning to forbid him but he quickly sent Hazleton down to turn off the city fathers before they could stop him. So with the city fathers turned off, Amalfi was going to try and tilt the planet. And he'd have to do it without their help. Amalfi and Hazleton then discussed what sort of problems may arise from their attempt to stabilize the planet's tilt. After some calculations, Hazleton said that the planet will probably go shooting off by itself at twice the speed of light. After Amalfi gave Hazleton permission to go and try and figure out a control system, he got a message 
from Sergeant Anderson, who told him that they got an ultra cast from an outfit claiming to be refugees from an Oki city that was broken up by a brindle stiff and that they crashed on this planet up north and they're being mobbed by one of the local bandit towns. And then they just stopped transmitting. So he grabbed his return and they left and headed out into the local city to meet with Miramon. When they met up with him, they explained everything to him and requested his help in locating the bandit town that's holding those people prisoner. When they showed him on a map where the signal came from, he told them that there's only one city up there that's a bandit town. It's called Faber Suite, and it is the leader of all of the bandit towns. Now, because the 23rd Street spin daisy machine was not working, they couldn't fly New York up there and do it themselves. So Amalfi then got Mary Mom to talk to the priest who agreed to lend them a small rocket task force to help them. The priest quickly agreed, glad that they were getting help in destroying a bandit town. In the rockets, they hooked up a tank filled with uranium hexafluoride. Once that was done, they took off and headed to the bandit city. Once over the city, they shattered the glass tank and allowed the mixture to fall. The city, of course, put up a fight shooting at them. They found the building with the most guards and blasted around it. Then they landed and went into the city and found, of the five Okies they found that were imprisoned, one had already died, one was begging for debt, so they killed him, and two of the other three were mad. Only one was still rational. They grabbed all of them and took off, headed back. But even with the rescue, the doctor that invented the fluorless drive was not among them. So Amalfi still did not gain access to it. Now he turned his attention to getting the planet ready to be moved. The first thing they did was to strengthen the crust of the planet. But as the work to begin strengthening the planet's crust began, he began to lose people. And that's when he realized that the Bindle stiff, the city, was already there, hidden somewhere on the planet. And he figured that out because they were using explosives that the natives didn't have access to. So after discussing the problem with Hazleton, he came up with a plan to smoke out the city. He advanced the planet's moving day by a thousand hours. Once Amalfi got back into the city, he found himself in an area of the old subway where D was hosing off the women in an attempt to clean them. He grabbed D and they headed to astronomy where they got Jake to look back the way they came and they saw a fleet of police cruisers headed their way. He then spoke to Hazleton whose plan is to use the local women to lure the bindle stiff out of hiding. The plan worked and they were able to locate where the bindle stiff was hiding and bindle stiff attacked. It was helping the bandit cities in their attack. But when the women were sighted, the bindle stiff went after the women and ended up in a pitched battle with their own allies. Pretty soon, the bindle stiff was fighting both their former allies, the bandits, and the regular civilized cities. So they decided now was a good time to leave, and they began taking off. And that was when Amalfi pushed the button to begin moving day. What happened next was six pillars of white energy that was 40 miles in diameter burst out from each of the compass points of the planet. And since the bandit town of Faber Suite sat directly on one of them, it was totally destroyed. What he had done was create the largest spin dizzy drive in history. It turned the world of he into a spin dizzy drive that was moving across the rift. And Amalfi realized he had miscalculated. The planet was rising up above the plane of the galaxy. And Hazleton checked and realized that they wouldn't be able to get the planet back to its sun because it would take them thousands of years to do that and they'll have to abandon the planet or they'll be stuck there going towards the next galaxy. So he gave the order and New York separated from the planet and watched as the planet disappeared. Hazleton was a bit worried because their contract didn't have an escape clause, but Amalfi told him not to worry that the Hevians will not be hurt. The spin dizzy screen that they put around the planet will protect them from loss of heat and atmosphere and the volcanoes will keep them warm, and the jungle will die as they wanted. 
and by the time they get to a star that they like in the Andromeda galaxy, they will understand it's been dizzy enough to put their planet into a good orbit. Or maybe they like roaming around. He went on to tell him that the Bengal stiff blew up, that apparently they had captured the doctor and they had built the fuel-less drive, but they didn't test it properly. When someone has an idea and builds something, you always have someone else look at it and test it before using it. And the Bengal stiff never did. They were in a hurry. So when they turned on their fuel-less drive, it blew up. And if they hadn't moved the planet, it would have blown up the planet too. And now they plotted an area to re-enter the galaxy and a place that would give them a fair population that they could do some work in. Amalfi wanted to find a place where they could set down and fix the 23rd Street spin dizzy for good. When D asked him where they're going now, he shrugged because they were going to go wherever they could. They then turned on the city fathers and the first question that was asked was if he had tipped the planet and he told them no, they sent it along as it was. The city fathers did not realize that they were no longer in the rift. So they wanted to give him a determination for the far rift wall. But he said that the far rift wall was a long time ago. The 23rd Street spin dizzy was making a lot of noise that permeated the entire city. They kept the hold that it was in sealed, not only to keep the noise down, but to keep the radiation that the malfunctioning spin dizzy was giving off from getting out. They were headed for the Acolyte star cluster and they needed to find a garage planet to set down on so that they could have their spin dizzy either repaired or replaced. But Hazleton was still worried about the cops who seemed determined to find them. And that was because their violations have been building up. And if they were to be caught and they'd have to pay in full, then they'd end up bankrupt. But Amalfi told him that the cops couldn't possibly follow them there because even they didn't know they were going to end up in the Acolyte star cluster. And just as he had finished speaking, the local cops caught up with them and came aboard. When the cops came on board, Amalfi could tell from the pistols that they held that they had had recent contact with other Oki cities. And that meant that there had to be a garage planet here somewhere. The cops wanted to know what type of business they did. And when Amalfi told him petroleum geology, in order to get through easy with no problems, Amalfi ended up buying a ribbon from the lieutenant for $500. That was essentially a bribe. Later, after the cops were gone, he told Hazleton that he bribed him because he wanted to make sure that the cops didn't look at their violations. Hazleton was still suspicious because he figured that the cop got bribed too easily and that they didn't even ask who the city was. Both he and Amalfi thought there was something else happening, but they couldn't figure out what. That's when they noticed that around a nearby red dwarf, there was hundreds of Oki cities. All those cities floating around like that was called an Oki jungle. Amalfi told them that the only thing that could cause that would be the complete collapse of the economy around this part of the galaxy. He believed that the people who ran the acolyte stars must be the cause, but he can't figure out why they're doing it. They must have a way to draw the Okies there in order to hire the few they need on a competitive basis, but what they're using them for, he couldn't figure out. Amalfi goes on to say that what scares him is that there's a lot of Okies in that jungle, and that if they had some place better to go, they would have. So he wanted to know why they haven't gone, why they are just sitting there. Soon they were approaching the garage world that had the name Murphy. As they got close to the planet, it looked empty. And as they got closer to the docks, there was only one city there. And once they got close enough to land, it was done automatic with no human involvement from the tower. Amalfi was still worried because he still hadn't had any official contact with the planet. After leaving men to guard the place, he grabbed Sergeant Anderson and Hazleton and they left the city and went down onto the dock. While they were heading down to the one tech they saw, Hazleton left them and went off to do something else. 
once they got to the tech, uh, Malfi made a deal with him to replace their spin dizzy. When Hazleton got back, he told Amalfi that he went over to take a look at the other city and that it is broken down and being repaired by locals, not the people that was on the city. Amalfi went on to tell him that he figured all that out by looking at the instruments when they were coming down. He said that what they are planning to do is to fix up the city and then send it to a gas giant so that they could get some ammonia and methane and other poisonous gases. He also knew that there was no Okies on it because the kind of work they were doing, Okies would not do. But the one thing that Hazleton knew was that the city was what was called the all-purpose city that was built three centuries ago. Just then they saw the garage tech running, coming toward them with a Maison pistol in his hand. So when Amalfi saw that, he sent Hazleton back to New York to link up the New York City Fathers to the other City Fathers. Hazleton took off running. When the garage technician reached Amalfi, Amalfi asked him what the problem was, and that's when he found out that germanium, which used to be the money tender in the galaxy, is no longer considered money. Anyone using germanium is now broke. When he had sent Hazleton off, he had told Hazleton to have the city fathers execute standard situation N. Situation N was a way for the city to get away extremely fast. When Amalfi turned the key, New York snapped out of its dock on Murphy and was gone. An hour later, the all-purpose city did the same. And it was now in orbit half a million miles away from New York. And both cities were now three light years away from the jungle and eight parsecs away from Murphy. Situation N was set up in such a way that the city fathers were the only ones that could activate it and use it. And they could only use it once because after it was used, they would forget all about it. The new monetary standard in the galaxy was the drug standard. Malfi now knew why the Oki jungle was there. All those Oki cities were caught with germanium as money. And when the new standard came about, they didn't have any drugs that they could use as money. Amalfi sent Hazleton over to the all-purpose city to see if there was anything over there that they could use, but it was completely wrecked. Now they had no choice but to head over to the Oki jungle. When Amalfi brought his city into orbit around the Red Dwarf, most of the cities that were already drifting in orbit around that Red Dwarf had their riding lights out. They were all trying to save power to keep their spin disease working. There was only one city with its street lights on, and Amalfi figured that that city was bragging that it had the power to do that. That city also held the best position close to the Red Dwarf. Amalfi was in the reception hall at City Hall where there are many screens so he could take a look at the meeting that was going on. On one of the screens, there was a woman that obviously was a trader from the Acolytes, and she was there to say that they wanted six cities to be paid on a per job basis. Then Lieutenant Lerner came on and gave the rules that if there was any disorder, nobody would get hired. He told them to put their bids into the lady and she will take it or leave it as she sees fit. Then from the bright city, a man spoke saying that Class A cities will ask for 124 for the job and Grade B cities don't get to underbid them unless the trader has all the Class A cities she can take. He was obviously the one in charge and he was setting the rules by which the cities would bid. From the video of the man who was speaking, they could see that not only was he old, but he had cancer. And although cancer had not been cured, it no longer killed. It just disfigured you. Acolytes that was there consisted of one tradership and four police craft. The lady had codes for 24 cities, and then she called out four of them. And Amalfi watched as four of his screens went blank. He watched as those four cities moved towards the trader ship. He said that's all we need for Hearn 6, which is the planet where the jobs are located. She next said there was eight cities that she was looking at that 
said they were pressure specialists. She asked the first three CDs on her list what they wanted for the job, and when they said 124, she turned and asked Amalfi, who said he was not a pressure specialist. She tried to convince him by offering him 120, and he still refused. So she turned to the next job. She wanted 20 cities to mine a small planet that was very near a hot star. Before she could begin, a city that was on the outskirts, that was not involved in the bidding, said that they would take the job. That city had broken the rules, and the king, who was from the bright city, yelled out at them that they should wait their turn. But that city was desperate, and they began to underbid the others, which then opened up a free-for-all with cities beginning to underbid each other. Then cities began to move closer to the trading ship, and that's when Amalfi told Hazleton that it's going to get worse, and he wanted them to move closer to the star when he gave his word. The lady got upset and then called off the whole thing and said she'd be back in a week. And as the trading ship and the police was getting ready to leave, cities began converging on them. Suddenly, fighting broke out as an Oki began firing on the cops. That was when Amalfi had Hazleton move the city closer to the star. Lieutenant Lerner, who was in charge of the police, did not really fire back. He just got his ships and the trader out of there. Once New York had gotten close to the bright city, they were less than a million miles away from them. That's when they stopped. That's when Amalfi told Hazleton that they were going to go and visit the king in the bright city, and he should bring Sergeant Anderson and D along. We will stop here and continue this in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.